I actually started out as an entrepreneur uh, with my own business out of college and grew that business and, and ultimately sold it at age 31 to Icon Office Solutions. Uh, so I've done small business. Uh, I then entered into the world of mid-sized public business. Icon was a, about a $5 billion company. I was with them while they grew to about $6 billion. And then I was recruited away by Toshiba to run a division in Irvine, California for them and where I made 55 acquisitions. So I've done a stint in uh, about 12 years in Fortune 100. And then most recently with a mid-sized or private company, McFarland Cascade. So I've done small business, mid-sized public, mid-sized private, and Fortune 100 in acquisitions in all of those categories. I've also crossed over technology, forest products, building products, and been in the energy space uh, along the way in accumulating those 80 acquisitions on the uh, the buy side and two on the sell. Inevitably, the final question I get asked, so what is M&A? Tell me, how do you do it? What are the secrets to it? And, and I describe it really as project management on steroids. And, <laughs> and the real reason why that is the best description is, is what you're doing is taking every function, every job, every process, every system, every piece of compliance between two companies, breaking it down <laughs> assessing gaps, cultural gaps, uh, personnel gaps, compensation gaps, every issue in every aspect of the business, and then determining how you're going to effectively sew those two organizations together. And that just results in a massive project on the other side of that. And if you fail to do that, you will fail in integrating the business. And it is a massive undertaking for the acquiring organization. So I mentioned the players on the team, and it's a vital again, that you build an A-team. Uh, it's much like running a business, and you only get one chance to sell your baby. So the, the real point that I want to emphasize is this is not a, not a time to be penny wise. You want to build a team with the best M&A attorney, the best accounting and tax advice you can, the best M&A advisor or IB uh, person that you can get uh, on your team, as well as the best business lead you can get. So I want to talk a little bit about the McFarland transaction and our team that we put together and how it impacted our deal. So we sold to a, a, a public company. This information is public. Um, our initial offer, we took aside a single strategic and a single private equity company and gave them an advanced look at the company. And the first offer came in at around $200 million or about a 6.8 multiple. Many people would be thrilled with a near 7 multiple. Uh, and good valuation on the business, but we were just getting going. And uh, we felt that that was a very low offer, that a 96-year-old business with the customer list that we had and the footprint that we had uh, commanded a greater valuation, and we were confident of that. So we decided uh, about a month later to shop in the private equity markets and lined ourselves up with about four or five key people that were good fit after a great amount of due diligence on them and had them look at the business Lots of presentations, takes a tremendous amount of energy and uh, involvement by the leadership team. And we had a second offer about a month later of $215 million from the private equity world, or about a 7.3 multiple. And then we waited, because we felt confident at that point in time. And sometimes waiting is the most strategic thing you can do. And we waited about a month later. And sure enough, the uh, strategic buyer came back with an offer of $230 million, or about a 7.8 multiple. We s struck an LOI. And the, team that, the thing that our team did at this point that really separated what I would call a, an average to an exceptional team is we wanted the returns of the current year. We knew we were on a great trajectory, breaking all the records of the company. We were growing at about 18%, and EBITDA was on track to grow about 40%, and we wanted to get paid for that. So we structured the working capital all the way back to January 1, and even though they were a public company, and, and after we got through Hart Scott Rodino, they made a press release announcing this at $230 million, we knew we weren't done yet. And about a week before the close, sure enough, uh, we closed on, on November 30th, and they had to put this press release out uh, about a week before the close that they were going to close at 250, more than 250 million, ended up being 251 million uh, for all of the working capital uh, contributions throughout the year 
and an 8.6 multiple. And that's what great teams can do for you. So it's essential that you put together the right team. We created $51 million of extra enterprise value in a short window of time uh, by having the right people on the team. And of course, that made for very happy shareholders. Let's talk about human capital and how you separate yourself from the crowd there. And this is candidly where I think my perspective as, as an operator probably differs, differs a little bit from my friends in private equity. And I think uh, if you're going to own and operate this thing and be inside the bowels of the business every day, day in, day after, you take a little different approach. So I've got a chart here. And what this shows is that for two or three years, a company is increasing its sales and profit. And I mapped against that employee engagement. And when things are good, employees are happy. And employee engagement is moving right alongside of revenues and profitability. Company gets acquired. They cut their 10% of the workforce, strategic uh, integration. And then, of course, other employees leave over engagement issues. They're hired away by the competitors. The IP leaves with them. The business suffers. Profits and revenue falls. And it takes years for it to come back to the level it was. Anybody heard this story before? Candidly, it goes on time and time again. But there is an evaluation model in the world that works this in, right? So obviously, you haven't succeeded if that's the approach you're going to take. So this is probably the single most important slide. I'm going to spend a little time on it. And it's, it, while it's an em acquired employee's perspective of the transaction, it's really about human behavior. And I presented this slide as part of my slide deck in every one of the kickoffs I did so that the employees knew I understood their feelings. And uh, let me walk you through this. It's really about the six stages of human behavior. And it's about getting people from the red through the yellow over into green. So stage one is about loss. When they get told that their business has been sold, they have feelings of fear. Their thoughts are cautious and their behavior is paralyzed, right? So if they're paralyzed, the business is not going to be productive. The next stage is doubt. Feelings of resentment, thoughts are skeptical, and behavior is resistance, resistance to change human behavior. So then stage three is discomfort. Feelings of anxiety, thoughts are confused, and they're unproductive still. And you have to get them out of the yellow, past this danger zone, into a state of discovery before you can be effective as a leader integrating this business. And my goal was to get everybody past that danger zone as fast as I could and over into the green as a leader. Stage five is an understanding. They get feelings of confidence, thoughts are pragmatic, and behavior is finally productive in stage five. And stage six, you can effectively, they're integrated, they're one company, feelings are satisfied, thoughts are focused, and behavior is finally generous. And until you get people in the green, it's really us and them. And you've got to act and behave as one company. And when I presented this chart, inevitably, when we went to the celebration meeting, I would have five and 10 people come up to me and say, I'm in the green already. And that's great. But I knew that there were still 90% of the people that weren't. And so it's vital to get the other employees into the green. It's also vital for the managers that lead the other people to understand this chart and the human behaviors behind it, because that's going to make them better managers. So my closing comments and lessons learned along the way for those 82 deals, uh, buying and selling, I've got five takeaways for owners. Um, and you've heard this theme recurring. You need to build an A-team, the best advisor you can get in every aspect from a professional services perspective, the best M&A attorney, best tax advice, the best investment banker or M&A advisor that you can get. Um, and you need to put and have in place the best management team and a business leader that can drive it. Uh, I use the word tie up your key employees with the CIC or a state of completion agreement. Um, while you're rewarding them with that, uh, you, you have to deliver all of those key employees, especially if you're looking at a financial transaction versus a strategic transaction. Um, but it is a reward for those employees. And my, my advice to the owners is you didn't get successful on your own. It's the team that helped you be successful. And make sure you take the opportunity to reward them at this time. You need to plan for this event in years, not months. And I think this is the mistake that so many people 
make is they say I'm going to sell and they decide within a window of six months they're going to get it done and you just can't do it in that time frame. Probably uh, the smartest thing the McFarlands did was, and it was about a three or four year window, and they brought me in and I put a professional team together and it allowed us to look very seriously uh, at the private equity world as well as the strategic market because those two gentlemen, although they were passively active in the business, were there for 45 years each. There's 90 years of experience there. And if a buyer perceives there's a vacuum of knowledge leaving, they're not going to pay for the business and they're going to say, I'm going to have to hire all these other people to replace you. But they had that team intact for two years and it, so we could go to both markets and there was no loss in value for the business. In fact, probably a strengthening. That was a really smart thing to do. And m many people look at that expense and say, that's really costly for a couple of years. But candidly, when you get $51 million extra enterprise value, it's pennies on the dollar. Uh, determine the legacy you want to leave behind. And I've sold my own business, and I think this is a really important message. What you really want to avoid, and a smart friend of mine told me this story once. He said, you want to avoid the cringe meeting in the grocery store two years down the road with an ex-employee who's lost their job, lost their home, and tells you that 30% of the workforce is no longer there and your business is a skeleton of what it used to be. So my point is choose wisely and choose a buyer that aligns with your goals and perspective. And while you can't control what occurs afterwards, it was interesting, I was at an M&A meeting uh, two days ago. Actually, Merrill had a great event and Kristen Schiller spoke, many of you may know Christian, and he made a statement that deals are now swinging. You know, 10 years ago, they used to be 100% based on valuation. And that was all that was a, a key tenant uh, for the, the buyer. But now valuation is, is coming down as a priority for a seller. And they're working more and more terms and conditions into a transaction that are important about the legacy of the business and the workforce. And you can do that. And the expectation, even with private equity, is that those, those terms are more important now. So, closing comments regarding successful integration. The, the failure points are avoidable, and they start really at a, a negotiation time frame, but the, the, the heart of the avoidable pain points are in due diligence and integration. So, I shared many, many uh, approaches here on how to avoid them. Please make sure you do that. You have to develop a blueprint for integration, and uh, it can't be an afterthought when you know the deal's done. It has to start on day one of due diligence and it should be mapped out for a year or as long as two years. Uh, number three is, is near and dear to me. Place a high value on human capital and the IP that's within it and understand what an unengaged workforce can do to productivity of a business and its performance. Uh, don't underestimate that if you're acquiring a business. Uh, you have to deliver a very effective kickoff and road show and have boots on the ground in the first 90 days is vital. Um, that is the show me phase and you need to get every employee into the green and add value and share your vision in that time frame. And that takes constant and frequent communication by the top executive leading that initiative and it's absolutely vital. They're involved, they're part of the boots on the ground and they're sharing that vision. So thank you very much. Hopefully that was insightful. Uh, I mentioned I was going to share the slide deck. It's actually out on my LinkedIn site. So you can go to Wayne Wilkinson 01 on LinkedIn and download the PowerPoint if you want the slide deck. Uh, you're welcome to it. Uh, if we don't answer any questions today, again, I, I, as uh, Catherine said, I'll stay around after. Or you can email me. My, my email is there, Wayne Wilkinson 01 at Gmail. And I'll invite our panelists and facilitator back to the, uh, to the front here. Thank you very much for your time.